If you were watching football in the late 2000s, chances are you got to witness possibly the greatest football team in history. Today, we hear people ask questions like, who would win a game between 0809 Barcelona and 2223 Manchester City? And that simply just tells us that a lot of people didn't watch or have just forgotten what the Barcelona team was like. Pep's Man City is great, no doubt, but Pep's Barcelona? Oh my goodness. But how good was the Barcelona 0809 team? So, let's start from the beginning. Looking at where Barcelona were coming from, they had no right to be that good. They finished third in La Liga in the previous season, 10 points behind Villarreal, who were in second. They were trophyless that season, after they were knocked out by Valencia in the Copa del Rey and Manchester United in the Champions League. Because of the poor campaign, Jean Laporta, the president of the club, didn't even wait till the season was over to announce that Barcelona would be saying goodbye to the coach, Frank Rijkaard, that summer. Barcelona fans were hoping for a big coach to come in. Jose Mourinho reportedly wanted the job, and considering he'd recently won the Champions League with underdogs Porto, he was looking like an exciting prospect. But instead, the club decided to go with an unknown. Well, an unknown in the coaching world, at least. Pep Guardiola had played for and even captained Barcelona in the past, but he'd just retired from professional football two years prior, and the only coaching experience he had was one year with the Barcelona B team. Handing over the keys to one of the biggest clubs in the world to this 37-year-old rookie didn't seem like a very good idea, and fans complained. But Pep did not even make his job any easier. Not long after he became head coach, he sent two of the club's best players packing, Ronaldinho and Deco. And it wasn't even because they were old or anything. Ronaldinho was just 28 at the time and was named FIFA World Player of the Year just two years prior. So, it was crazy to fans that this newbie would do such a thing. There was already a lot of pressure on him to deliver, being young, unknown and inexperienced. But he doubled, or maybe even tripled that pressure by selling off Deco and Ronaldinho before he even coached his first official game. And he didn't sign any replacements. That was the craziest part. I mean, he did sign Sedu Kita, Dani Alves, Alexander Glieb, brought back Gerard Piquet, and promoted a certain Sergio Busquets from the academy. But he didn't exactly purchase like-for-like -like replacements for Deco and Ronaldinho. So, everyone was tuned in to see what this guy would produce. With the decisions he'd made before the start of the season, everyone expected him to fail, and he didn't take long to prove everyone right. Pep Guardiola lost his first ever La Liga game to newly promoted Numancia, a club that went on to suffer relegation that season. In the next game, he could only secure a point against Racing Santander after a 1-1 draw, so best believe the criticisms were loud. I mean, who did this rookie think he was, anyway? Coming in and selling off Ronaldinho and Deco, and only bringing in some kids like Piquet, Alves and Busquets. People said that Barcelona had made a mistake with this one, and Pep Guardiola was surely destined for failure. Well, all of that just woke up the beast in Pep. Guess how he responded? He went on a 21-game unbeaten run in La Liga. During that period, he won 19 games and drew two. But it wasn't just that he was winning those games, it was also how he was winning them. Pep brought in a style of play that nobody had ever really seen before. Yeah, he may not have invented the tiki-taka style of play, but he perfected it. In just his first season at Barcelona, he was able to drill his players to hold the ball and dominate possession to perfection. This team were playing some really beautiful football, which involved building out from the back and using short passes to progress the ball from defense all the way to attack. The football was free-flowing, beautiful, and just unstoppable. It was Pep's idea that if his team kept the ball, there was no way that they could lose, and that turned out to be so true. Not only were they winning games, but they were also winning them very comfortably. We just kept seeing high victory margins from Barcelona week after week. 6-1 against Sporting Gijon. 6-1 against Atletico Madrid. 5-0 against Almeria. 6-0 against Valladolid. 4-0 against Valencia. 5-0 against Deportivo. But during this run, Barcelona were only able to beat Real Madrid 2-0 at the Camp Nou. 
They weren't satisfied, so they planned to revisit that. But before they got their chance, their streak was snapped. After winning 10 straight league games, Barcelona finally dropped points, drawing to Real Betis in February. What we didn't know was that was the start of a bad spell. They lost the derby to Espanyol, which meant that it was their city rivals who snapped their unbeaten run. Barcelona had beaten Espanyol in their first meeting in the league and knocked them out of the Copa del Rey. So this was revenge for the neighbors, and they were loving it. But for Barcelona, that surely hurt. But what made it hurt even more was the fact that that was their first league loss at Camp Nou that season, and the fact that it came at the hands of their neighboring rivals hurt so much, and it destabilized them. Barcelona started to falter, and it was so bad that it nearly cost them everything. How? We'll tell you in a bit. But first, if you're enjoying the video so far, give it a thumbs up and subscribe to the channel. Okay, so they went five straight games without a win in all competitions. Three days after the derby, they drew against Lyon in the round of 16 of the Champions League. And when they returned to La Liga, they lost again, this time to Atletico Madrid, who were also challenging for the title. Just like it was with Espanyol, this was sweet revenge for Atletico. They'd lost 6-1 to Barcelona earlier in the league and lost home and away to them in the Copa del Rey. So, being able to get their own back by further knocking Barcelona off their rhythm felt so, so good. If Barcelona did not get back on their grind, they would have gotten knocked out of the Champions League and lost their place at the top of La Liga. They desperately needed a response, and that was exactly what they produced. Do you see how Pep's Man City always goes into beast mode at the business end of the season these days? Yeah, it all started then. After that loss to Atletico, Barcelona knew they had to get their house in order, and they did exactly that. At this point in the season, Pep had assembled what looked like the greatest team ever. The defense was great, no doubt, but from the midfield up was where the world saw terrifying things. The trio of Xavi, Iniesta and Busquets turned out to be so perfectly balanced. Everyone complimented one another. There was absolutely nothing they lacked. With that midfield three, Barcelona were always able to dictate the pace of games against whatever team they faced. And then, up front, they had Pedro, Eto and Henri all of whom were so good. But most importantly, they had Lionel Messi, who was already the best, most prolific, most entertaining, and most dominant player in the world, and in fact was already on his way to proving that he was the greatest of all time. And what was interesting was that before Pep took over, many of these guys weren't so highly rated, but he came back and instantly turned them into world beaters. And he was able to build a system that was self-sufficient, to the point where he didn't even need all his best players to be playing to get results. And you'll see the perfect demonstration of that soon. But let's first focus on how Barcelona bounced back from that bad spell. They went on to win their next seven league games by an aggregate score of 18-0. The dominance was just insane. During that run, they also beat Lyon 5-2 in the return leg of the round of 16 tie before then going on to embarrass Bayern Munich 5-1 over the two quarterfinal legs. It just felt like Barcelona got more brutal and way more entertaining at the business end of the season. There was a little stumble, though. They drew back-to-back -back games against Valencia in the league and Chelsea in the first leg of the semi-final of the Champions League. But how did they respond? With a heavy 6-2 win against deathly rivals Real Madrid at the Santiago Bernabeu, now that was a victory that felt good. After that win against Madrid, Barcelona didn't win any other league game, drawing two and losing two. But it didn't matter because they'd already wrapped up the league. Their focus was on the Champions League, and it was there that we saw the only team that proved difficult for Barcelona over two legs that season. You see, guys like Espanyol, Atletico, Lyon, Real Betis and Valencia proved difficult for Barcelona at one point or another, but that only happened in one game. In the other leg of the fixture, Barcelona made sure to dominate and win. But this was not the case with Chelsea in the semi-finals of the Champions League. Both legs were very difficult for Barcelona. Chelsea put up a very strong defensive wall and were able to stop Barcelona from penetrating. Over the two legs, Barcelona scored only one goal, 
and that goal came in the 93rd minute of the second leg, which meant that Barcelona advanced on the away goals rule. We have to say, though, the game was controversial. Chelsea had some penalty shouts that weren't given, and Barcelona themselves saw a man sent off unjustly. The entire officiating in that game did not spark much confidence, and it was the only blip in what was a perfect season for Barcelona, at least since after the shaky start. Because of the semi-final, people started to have doubts about Barcelona and how they would do in the final against Manchester United. United were the best team in the world, at least before Barcelona came up. They had won the Champions League the previous season, even beating Barcelona in the semi-final. They just won the Premier League for the third time in a row. They had the reigning Ballon d'Or winner in Cristiano Ronaldo and were led by the best coach in the world, Sir Alex Ferguson. On top of that, Barcelona were missing key players, Dani Alves and Eric Abidal, due to suspension. So, everyone expected them to struggle against the champions. But as we said earlier, Pep created a system that was so good that even without his best players, he could still win games. And we saw that in the final. Pep used Yaya Torre at centre-back and Carles Puyol at right-back and still beat the best team in Europe in the biggest game in club football even keeping a clean sheet in the process. Barcelona dominated Manchester United in that game and came out 2-0 winners. That win meant that Barcelona became the first team in the history of Spanish football to complete the European treble. And for them to do it in the fashion they did, and in Pep's first season as a first-team coach, was truly incredible. Unlike many great teams, Barcelona did not have to sacrifice the aesthetics and entertainment for results. They entertained, dominated, annihilated, and won everything. We'd never seen anything like that before. But it didn't even end there. Barcelona went on to win the UEFA Super Cup, Spanish Supercopa, and the FIFA Club World Cup, making them the first football club in the entire history of European football to ever complete the sextuple. We were looking at a team that won every single competition they participated in that year. It was truly indescribable. You just had to be there. After such an amazing season, Lionel Messi won the Ballon d'Or, and we saw four Barcelona players finish in the top five. Eto was fifth, Iniesta was fourth, Xavi was third, and then Messi. This team dominated games, dominated trophies, and still dominated awards. So, how good was the Barcelona 0809 team, you say? Honestly, they're maybe the greatest football team the world has ever seen. If you don't agree with that statement, feel free to get in the comments and tell us which team you think is better. But while you argue which team is the greatest ever, we're sure we can all agree that MSN is the greatest attacking trio of all time. If you want to know how they earned that status, click this link and we'll tell you the whole story. Thanks for watching our video and hit the like and subscribe buttons if you enjoyed it.